so I want to talk to you today about how I learned to stop worrying and love TypeScript. Um, as you heard, my name is Tommy. I'm a full stack web developer at NPR. So we're all nerds here, but the nerds I work with are a particular brand of nerds. We're public radio nerds, which, you know, in nerddom is like somewhere in there. Um, I have been there since November of 2016, but since September of 2017, I've been working on a team that we call the Voice Platforms team. So I've been working primarily with a different sort of UI. Um, I've been working on uh, voice applications. They call them skills or actions in the Alexa or the Google Assistant world. Um, but a, the focus of those has been getting NPR's content onto those platforms. And we write most of that code in Node.js. Um, so it's sort of like a hybrid between back-end code and front-end code. And it's been really interesting and a fun space to be working in. So the question I think that comes up first is why TypeScript? And so just I'm curious here, how many of you have used TypeScript? So good, like 50% plus. How many of you would continue to use TypeScript that have used it? So good, we've got a good amount. Um, how many of you would like to try using TypeScript but haven't tried it yet? How many of you are like, I don't, I'm completely uninterested in TypeScript? <laughs> cool, right, no, <laughs> more power to you, that's good. Um, so, Kind of reflective of this study, which was uh, the 2018 State of JS study. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with that. If you're not, check it out. They surveyed just over 20,000 developers um, this past time and found that 46.6 had used it and would use it again, that 5.4% had used it and wouldn't use it again, that there were 33.7% that had heard of it and wanted to learn it, and then that there were like 13.7 that had heard of it and were not interested in learning it. And then there's like a 0.4%. They're like, TypeScript, never heard of it. And I don't know who those people are. But it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. No shame. If you're one of them, it's okay. You're going to learn about it today. So the more interesting thing to me has been this trend that's been happening over the last few years. And, and that's that the number of people who have used it and would use it again continues to grow. The number that have used it and don't want to use it again is still significantly small. And the group that is shrinking the most is those who are like, heard of it, don't want to use it. So some of you who don't want to use it, I'm hoping maybe we convert you today. It's OK if we don't. Even if you're here and you're like totally uninterested in TypeScript, I still think there's something in this talk for you. Because at the end of the day, what we're really talking about when we're talking about TypeScript, and just as far as scope here, we're not, it's not going to be a super technical deep dive. It's not going to be a broad talk where we cover all the things TypeScript does. It's going to be more focused on the narrative around my relationship to TypeScript. And I think because of that, we're really talking about how we work, the way we do the things we do, what we can learn in the process. So why me? Well, a few reasons not. I'm not the most qualified person here to talk about this, so should get that out of the way. I'm probably not the most experienced. I've been working with TypeScript for like a year and a half, but I'm sure some of you have been working with it longer than me. I'm not the most knowledgeable. There's probably people here who can do a better job than me. But what I do bring uniquely to the table is my own story of my relationship to TypeScript. And I do think that because I'm not the most qualified, uh, because I'm an average developer, I think, I would say that maybe my what I have to share today will be more relatable to the group of us. That's my hope. So what I do have today <laughs> is a story about how I went from a TypeScript skeptic, like my friend here, to a TypeScript fanboy, and how that transformation happened for me. Um, this story is best started with an explanation of what I mean when I say that I'm a TypeScript skeptic, and the sort of ingredients that went into creating that reality for me. Um, the first thing is my own background. I don't have a computer science background. I'm what you would call a second career dev. I may look like a child, but I'm 37. So um, yeah, I know, weird. Um, I, studied, I studied theology, which um, Jesus is my homeboy, but he doesn't know anything about TypeScript. I'm not a lead hacker at all. Um, and so to me, TypeScript was one of those things as far as the way that um, imposter syndrome has presented for me. TypeScript was one of those things that like, I was like, oh, that's what like super awesome developers do, and I'm not one of those. I know how to do some stuff, but that just made it seem like inaccessible. Additionally, my own experience, where I would have loved to be like this little dude over here, who seems to be loving his life with his computer, I often was more like Maurice Moss, who just wanted to break my stuff. 
And that was because when I first, my first tech job, if I rewind to like 2009, um, was working in a support role for this big telecommunications company. And I was working on tools that supported their NOC. And I was doing a lot of like Perl scripting and learning some PHP. And I wanted to be a developer. And my manager was like, handed me this massive book. It was like this. It was a C++ college textbook. I was like, learn this. And um, it was terrible. <laughs> it was a terrible, <laughs> terrible book. And I would get these compiler errors. And I was like, this is my fault. I'm just bad at this. This is not the career for me. And then my own biases went into play. At that same job, things were totally wild west. Like, we pretty much didn't use version control for most things. And we just like SSH to a server and change things live. And so like, it was just like, get, get stuff done. Sorry, I shouldn't curse here. Um, I do that too much. Um, so, so I was like, and then the next job I had was in an agency setting. And so there, we were a little less wild west. But it was still like, hey, the main criteria for assessing what we use is how fast can we get it to the state that a client will accept it, which is not a great way to make products. That's what we were doing. So that's kind of where I was coming from. So in my mind, TypeScript was something that I was like, I'm unqualified for because I don't have the background. I hate compiled languages because they give me hives. And additionally, <laughs> like it seems like a time sink. So I was not very in on it. But there is a process where I, I did become a fan. And I think we'll talk about the process itself. But I want to start with the overarching theme that for me, the biggest change has been that TypeScript, as I have embraced it and learned to love it, um, at first not so willingly, is that it has helped me move from confusion to clarity in a couple of specific areas. Number one, um, clarity when it comes to reading code. So one of the things that I was not aware of when I first became a developer was that the bulk of my time would not be spent writing code but especially working with code bases that have existed for a long time, you do a lot of reading code. And you start to recognize code that is pretty smelly. And um, I found that so far in, with TypeScript that reading code has been a much more pleasant experience. Um, annotations, type signatures are really helpful. Additionally, while I'm writing code, it forces me to be a little bit more clear about what I'm trying to do. I can't be like, well, it's going to do a thing. Um, like, I need to actually define what that thing is with like an interface or something. Additionally, while running code, inevitably we run into errors. And I have found that like TypeScript has my back in this case because it makes it a little bit more simple for me to um, troubleshoot bugs. So that's sort of the big, the big picture. But now we're going to dive into the specifics of my journey from skeptic to fanboy, a journey that's still, un you know, I'm still undergoing, but I'm definitely, definitely a fanboy. I'm here talking about it. I'm trying to sell people on it, right? So it's a two-part journey. Um, those two parts are two different projects that my team was working on. So the first one was an Angular upgrade that we worked on. Um, so this happened at the end of 2017, beginning of 2018. I probably need to step back a step to give some clarity around what our application was. So are any of you familiar with NPR1, what that is? OK, so for those of you, there's a handful. For those of you who aren't, sort of the elevator pitch for NPR1 is that it's Pandora for public radio. So the idea is you've got like news, stories, podcasts, that um, the more you listen, the more we're going to learn about you and what you like. But it also, because it is a news app, and if I'm frank and honest, Pandora for public radio without some human intervention sounds terrible in today's political climate. So um, we're aware. We're trying to be good citizens here. There's a heavy editorial hand that makes sure, like, hey, when news is happening, we want to make sure everyone hears it. And so this particular application was an NPR1 application. It was not a voice application. but it belonged to our team that does voice for historic reasons. So the lead developer on our team, Nara, and another developer at NPR, a guy named Jared, had built this. And when they wrote this application, Angular was in it, the beta form of release candidate one when this went live. And then we moved on to other things, and we never like upgraded it for a while. So then we came to like end of 27, beginning of 2018, and we wanted to upgrade straight to Angular 5. And I had only ever worked with AngularJS, and I had spent the last year and a half writing React. And so I was like, oh, man, this is different. And then because Angular and TypeScript tend to go really well hand in hand, Nara was like, "We're gonna let's do TypeScript. And I was like, OK. 
But inside, I was like, not okay. But hey, like, I was going to trust her. She's pretty great. And so um, there were a handful of things that got me like this, where I was like, ooh, TypeScript. Like, I'm into this. And so the first was that I felt like I experienced increased readability and self-documenting code as we did this. And that I bring up this point because the, the process we worked through, <coughs> Nara started working on this probably a couple weeks before I did. So by the time I jumped in, she had converted a good like 80% of the functionality. And we had like 100% unit test coverage, but none of the unit tests had been updated. So I was like going to come in behind and play cleanup and like started working on unit tests. So as I jumped into the code base, the bulk of it had already been converted to TypeScript. And so I was learning this code base while I was learning TypeScript. And at first, that was scary. But TypeScript ended up being a huge help in gaining a quick understanding of what the different methods and functions and variables and properties that were present in this application were all about so that I didn't have to dive through and read every part of every file. I could get a quick idea of what something was doing. I could change tests, make them work, so on. It was a great experience. Now, one of the arguments against TypeScript when it comes to readability that I have heard is this. Hold up, Tommy. Can't TypeScript files be like 30% longer than a JavaScript file? And I'm like, sure. They can, right? Like, they're probably 20, 25%, 30% longer. But I think the premise here is that longer means harder to understand. But that we already know that's false. Like, how many of you try and name your variables the shortest thing possible? Like, that guy. <laughs> Did you see who this is? This is my favorite troll right here, Zach. I love him, but I'm going to hurt him later. Um, just kidding, I don't hurt people. Um, so. Anyway, yeah, it's sometimes, not a while. Um, anyway, I would point out that like there's all sorts of things we can do to make files short that don't make them readable. I think even though the files can be longer, your ability to quickly grok what's going on grows exponentially from my perspective. So this was the first thing that I was like, oh, didn't expect this. This is kind of a win from TypeScript. And the second thing was that seems pretty basic, but IDE support and integration. I had recently made the switch to VS Code. By the way, this morning's presentation was amazing. Super excited about that remote um, concept. To be able to spin up a VM in the cloud is really cool. Um, so the IDE support and integration, like in VS Code context, um, I think probably everyone here is, is familiar with the fact that like the, your JavaScript is already being processed under the hood by TypeScript if you're using VS Code. So you're getting all sorts of benefits from it. But the moment your project incorporates TypeScript, you like supercharge that. And so the way that works is you start getting all sorts of like ways that your annotations and your uh, type signatures and stuff start showing up on Hover in different places and can be really helpful. And one of the things that when I brought this up in the past that people have brought up is like, hey, like my ID, my ID already does all kinds of great stuff. In other words, it's already good enough. Why should I add TypeScript? And I think this is a co another common thing, argument that we come across in our day-to-day -day lives that's of the sort that's like, why should I make anything better? It works well now. And I would say, you know, there's all sorts of things that we could say that about. Like, that's the nature of innovation, right? Most of the time, we don't realize that what we've been doing is painful, and there's a better way to do it. And that's been my experience with TypeScript, even super basic, super simple things like this. Like, this is um, from one of our. Um, Alexa apps. I had to jump in and change something the other day. I couldn't remember what begin flow did. Pre TypeScript, I would have jumped in there and started reading the function. But on Hover, I get the type signature and I can instantly see, okay, handle in input because I'm familiar with Alexa. I'm like, okay, I know what that is. This is what we get, the event that comes in, what we return from this is a response. So I'm like, okay, this thing does everything I need to do to start an audio flow. And I send it back to the Alexa platform, and I'm ready to roll. So I have found this kind of very basic support to be like a huge time saver, and also something that makes it way easier to onboard new developers who are trying to learn new technology. That way, the code is sort of out of the way, and they can be presented with what a thing does, right? Like they can see what the inputs are, see what the output is, and it's OK if the rest is kind of a black box. Like they don't need to go examine the guts of this function at all. So the takeaways that I'd have for you, if you find yourself in this place where your first project is like um, one where you are adding, where you're adding TypeScript to an existing project, there's some huge pitfalls here. And I feel like this is one of the times when people tend to try TypeScript and then reject TypeScript is when they're doing this. 
The first thing I would say is like, keep things as loose as possible when you begin. So there's all sorts of ideals around TypeScript of like, hey, you know, we shouldn't allow any implicit any, and like, we should go in, and all these sorts of things. But when you start, you should actually make your TypeScript config as permissive as possible. So that when you start, you're basically like, let's say you're writing a React app. All you really are doing is you're swapping your, your Babel compiler for a TypeScript compiler. And you can leave all the files as JS files and like compile. And like you're using TypeScript, right? And then you can start going through a file at a time and switching it from .js to .ts. And you might get a couple errors. And so you work through and you fix them. And as you do that, I would say the next step then is as you're going through and fixing those small errors that come as you change it to like a .ts file. So you want to make sure that the annotations you're adding are not just about like fix the errors, but are like, hey, how can we improve the readability of this? And the second thing that inevitably happens, how can we expose what our actual problem area is in the app? Like, hey, we thought we were passing a, a Boolean here, and it's really a string, something like that. So then the next thing, sort of paradoxically, is after you finish that, you want to tighten everything up. And so first, that means you're going to start going through and adding more and more meaningful type definitions. But it also means that in your config and your linter, you're going to tighten up all the rules to your ideal and work towards them. And if you have to then relax them because you've taken the project as far as you have time to do, that's OK. Like My position on TypeScript is not one where you need to go like all the way all the time. Like Get it as far as you can. It's great if you can have, like a, you know I don't have any type any in my code base or something like that. But like, be realistic, because I think it adds benefit, um, even if this is where you find yourself. So then the second part of my story it comes, on the, comes on the heels of this. So we wrapped up this project, and we had another NPR1 client, the Alexa one. It was an existing skill that Amazon had built for us right when the platform launched. So Echo devices are first being sold, and they wanted NPR to be a a partner from the beginning, and so they helped us build this NPR1 skill, and then they maintained it for us for a couple of years, and then they were handing it over the fence to us. We hadn't seen the code, like, and so we started talking through it as a team. We knew that there was a handful of known bugs, and so we were kind of like, well, you know what, like, let's go ahead and let's just assume, rather than taking on the maintenance of code we didn't write, we got our product owner to agree with the idea that we should rewrite this thing from scratch. And so when we did, because we had just come off a project where TypeScript was a big win for both of us. We're like, let's do it in TypeScript. So this is our first like node TypeScript project. Um, and there were a couple other things that got me like this about TypeScript again. I was already in, but kind of pushed it to the next level. And they come down to this idea of catching type errors at compilation or earlier. And I'm not so much concerned about this issue here of like performance, right? So like I've had some people say this, hey, like type checking, whatever. You can do these at runtime. There's an argument to be made that like this can cause bottlenecks. But like, in a bigger picture, this idea of catching errors early, so like as you're writing, um, can involve a paradigm shift in how you think about errors. And I think this is the biggest win for me in relationship to TypeScript. When I first started using TypeScript, and I inevitably would run across errors like this, that when I first read them seemed obtuse and opaque and difficult to understand, I always saw them as indicators of my own failure. That's a problem I have. Just going to get that out there, right? Like, this is on me. So um, instead, I have come to see these similar to how I would if I was do using like a test-driven development pr approach, where like, OK, I'm going to create the standard, and I'm going to expect it to fail. And then I'm going to make the changes I need to to bring it in alignment. So this is if you're starting off with like a, you know, a new project that's going to be TypeScript. And so in this case, then, I have an error like these ones. Like, let's look at the second one down here, where I'm told, like, if you read this thing, you're always going to get a file name it came from. You're always going to get the line number. You're even going to get the position it came from. And you're told that your problem is that at that position, there is something there that is of the type object with a string key or any number of string keys. And then the property of that can be anything. And that that's not assignable to type Boolean. And you're like, yeah, that's right. And so in this case, this is like a real problem if we weren't aware of this, right? If this was caught at runtime, you could have an object that's empty and is you know, giving you a false like truthy value or whatever, depending on how you're checking for truthiness. And so these kind of things became huge for me. 
um, when I embrace them as friends, right? So these errors are my friends. Here's another way this shows up. I've got a type that's like, hey, I'm an object with something called an access token and something called a refresh token, and I may or may not have the refresh token. And then it's like, well, you have a type called tokens, but you can't put that thing there. And then down below, it tells me specifically, you know why? Because it doesn't have a property called refresh token. Well, in that case, like I'm doing something wrong. Like That tokens object isn't what I thought it was. And then the third thing you'll see, especially once you start removing implicit any's from your code base, these are what I would say are the three most common error types you'll encounter in TypeScript. And there's more, but they're understandable as well. Um, here in this file, we're told, hey, you're importing something from a node module, and I don't know anything about that thing. So I've assumed it could be anything, right? And then it tells you, like, try npm install at type slash universal analytics. How many of you guys have, are familiar with like the at types? Yeah, so a handful who have worked with TypeScript are. So there is this amazing project called Definitely Typed that maintains a GitHub repository of like a one-to-one -one relationship for many, not all, but many of the node modules that are out there. So you get type definitions for them that are community generated sometimes by the people who write the modules, sometimes by users of the modules. It's great. So it, it tells you here, first try that. If it doesn't exist, create a declaration file, and then just declare it, right? And this could be as simple as explicitly saying this isn't any, right? So the idea here is TypeScript, once again, this is, a, this is a friend, not an enemy. TypeScript is just letting you know you're bringing something into, into your project that I don't know about. Try and tell me something about it, and we can work better together. A couple key takeaways from this idea. Um, number one is that I'm just going to hammer this home, just if you didn't already realize this. Errors are your friends. And I think this is a key way to think about them. No matter what kind of error you encounter, <laughs> It's revealing some kind of inconsistency in your code. Therefore, it's an ally, not an enemy. Now, this could be internal inconsistency, right? It could be an inconsistency with an external node module dependency. It could be an inconsistency with what you expect to get back from an API, but are getting back, you know, you're getting back something different. But no matter how you slice it, these errors that are coming up, there is some kind of inconsistency or lack of information that we can fairly easily provide with, provide TypeScript with to make a better developer experience. Um, secondly, I would say, even though at the beginning, <laughs> type any is really helpful for getting started, it's not your friend because in most cases when you do run into problems with TypeScript, it's stuff that's hiding behind this. Like you're making assumptions about what's behind this any and you're assuming some wrong things. So I would say, even if it's something as simple as being like, well, I know this is an object, I know all my keys are strings because you're nuts if you're using keys that aren't strings. And all your properties could be anything. Even if that's what you define it as, at least then if you just get a string, you're going to know. It's going to whine at you. Don't forget to config. I throw this in here simply because if you read the TypeScript getting started guide, this is my, like, I love TypeScript's documentation, <laughs> but the quick start five minute guide is terrible <laughs> because it has you start just using the command line um, compiler with no configuration. And if you do that in a project that already has node modules, the first thing you ever see, your first experience with TypeScript, will be it trying to compile everyone else's code and throwing like literally tens of thousands of errors at you. And I've seen blog posts that are like, this happened, <laughs> F TypeScript, end of story, right? Like, don't do that. But also, don't just grab like um, any config. Think about it. Like, learn a little bit about the config. But then also know that there's all sorts of existing tools that are out there. So Create React App version 3 just came out. It has really great TypeScript support out of the box now. It had it in version 2, but it has advanced um, quite a bit. Angular has amazing TypeScript support, especially with their CLI tool. Vue has TypeScript support. Pretty much anything that you're going to be doing in the JavaScript world at this point, someone has put together some starter kits for you. Like, Take advantage of them if you're just getting started, the same way you would create React app, the same way you would with your web cap, Webpack configs. Like, How many of you are like, I will never use someone else's config. I always write my configs from scratch. They got, they got like one dude. It's Jamie, right? Nice. OK, so um, yeah, there's always that guy, right? But most of us are like, no, don't do that. Like, That's a good way to, to poison yourself. 
Um, so there's all sorts of helpful resources available from the TypeScript community. These first three are all from the official TypeScript documentation. I want to make it clear that documentation is great with that one exception. Like That's my only qualm with it. Their quick start samples are amazing. They've got a guide for migrating from JavaScript to TypeScript that's a great, like I think, complement to what I was talking about in that same realm. The handbook that's part of the documentation is really great. But then I would say this last one, if you are going to go all in on TypeScript and you start using it, this book by Basara Ali Syed, um, TypeScript Deep Dive, it's available for free online. It's amazing. Everyone I know who's writing a lot of TypeScript loves this book. Um, all the devs that are working with TypeScript at NPR love this book. We're all fans. So I'll point these to you. I'm going I'm to tweet a link to this, but I also have a link. This is meta, but I have a link in the presentation on the last slide to this presentation, however that works. Um, so you can just, it's a bit.ly, you can punch it in. This is my wonderful team. Um, NPR is hiring. So if you want to come work with these beautiful people and write some TypeScript, we would love to have you come talk to us. Um, this bottom here, bit.ly slash TypeScript love, is where you'll find this presentation. NPR Tech Jobs, that's where you will find out how to come work with us. Even if you don't like me, you can work with the rest of my team. They're better than me. Um, NPR.codes is our blog. I'm open in the next couple weeks to start some posts around this same content. Um, you can find me on Twitter, but you're probably going to be disappointed because I talk about all sorts of things and not much about my job. <laughs> um, and then there's my email if you want to like rant at me or whatever. So that's it. Thanks.